Okay, uh, welcome to Theories of Personality. Um, this is still week four. Today we're covering the second half of the uh, lecture on, um, second half of the chapter on um, uh, Alfred Adler's theory. Remember, he's, uh, he's considered a neo-Freudian, someone who lived at the time of Freud and knew about Freud. So there's a few similarities between his theory and Freud's theory. But uh, we talked about a lot of things already, uh, you know, um, and uh, we're going to move on. Remember, we, we talked about feelings of inferiority that drive development. We talked about the inferiority complex, superiority complex. We talked about the, uh, basically, uh, the personality types, the dominant type, you know, the uh, getting type, the avoiding type, and the socially useful type, and, and how social interest is uh, basically what uh, determines if you're the socially useful type. And that, that is basically uh, driven by interactions, early, uh, in early interactions with the mother. So your style of life is set by age four or five. Okay, just to review a little bit. Um, something else I wanna talk about that's very important to uh, uh, Alfred Adler's theory, which is actually very interesting, is birth order. Okay, remember those early interactions with the mother are important. Um, and it turns out that the order in which you're born will affect your personality, okay? It will affect your style of life, okay? Um, because children, even if they're born into the same household with the same parent, um, are born in a slightly different uh, situation, a slightly different environment, uh, depending on whether they're first, second, third, the youngest, the oldest, uh, that kind of stuff. So we're going to talk about that, how birth order affects personality. So the firstborn, okay, so, um, uh, you know, uh, the firstborn, uh, or, you know, the first child that is born has a very unique situation uh, that they're born into. Um, when the firstborn comes along, uh, they have all their parents, parents' attention and resources, okay? So with your first child, um, I mean, there is no other child. So they get all the attention from the parents. You usually try to do a very good job of raising them. They get a lot of attention. Uh, whatever the parents have, the re as far as resources, time, attention, money, and stuff like that, they use it for that child, okay? So they don't really have to share at the beginning. They have a unique situation there. And they're usually very happy, very well taken care of until the arrival of the second born. The second born child really changes things for the, sec for the first born. Uh, once the second born uh, child arrives, uh, the first born feels dethroned. They feel that they've been knocked off the throne, so to speak. They had all the attention, all the resources. They were like the king or queen. And now that the second child is born, they're no longer the priority anymore. They're no longer the baby. And now parents have a second child to take care of. So it's like they're knocked off the throne. Okay, you don't matter that much anymore or as much as you did before. So they feel dethroned. They feel outraged, upset. They want their former position, right? They want to be the center of the tension. They want to be the only thing that matters, okay? So they feel dethroned, okay? And because of that, they may actually engage in troublesome behavior. They may become destructive, hate and resent the second born for knocking them off their throne, for taking away their cherished uh, position. They may show troublesome behavior, okay? They may be mean and hostile toward the second born and hate the second born, okay? Say, hate the second born child. Um, the firstborn also benefits uh, from power, okay? Uh, they are the oldest, okay, the firstborn. So they're the oldest sibling. So they will often play the role of the teacher and will teach the younger child how to do certain things or certain things about the world. The tutor, they'll be the leader, okay? They'll have a little bit more authority than the secondborn. Uh, and they can also be the dis disciplinarian. Even if the parents you know, don't really allow it, uh, the uh, oldest uh, child, the firstborn, may take it upon themselves, you know, to basically punish the younger child when he, he or she does something they don't like, okay? But we'll also teach them and tutor them and lead them and guide them and do things like that, okay? So they, uh, yeah, the firstborn uh, is basically gets to benefit from power, has a taste of power, so to speak. They were on the throne, you know, they had all the attention, and they also have a taste of some power because there's somebody under them if there's a second born, okay? As adults, firstborn children tend to be high achievers, right? They're used to having, getting lots of attention and having resources. Uh, they tend to be organized, authoritarian. They're used to being in charge and used to having some power. 
If things don't work out, so if things work out well for them, they'll be high achievers, organized. Authoritarian means that they like to be in charge. They like to tell people what to do. What to do. Um, but if things don't go well for them, they will feel insecure, okay? Very insecure about themselves and about their abilities, hostile and even aggressive. They'll be very upset, basically, and angry that things didn't work out for them because they should, they should have been the high achiever. They should have been the leader, the one in charge. That's what they were used to as children. So if things don't work out, then uh, yeah, they have problems. I, I have a, a brother who actually, uh, you know, my oldest brother actually had that situation. Well, of course he was the firstborn, yeah. So at the beginning he was all that mattered, right? Was treated very well. And then the second born came along and knocked him off his throne. And uh, he got it, he resented that second born, right? Uh, and I remember they got into a lot of fights Okay, even when I was growing up, when I, when I came along and they were a little bit older, they, yeah, they had a lot of fights, okay, a lot of arguments, fist fights, they're both males, right, two brothers, and they competed a lot with one another, and there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of, uh, uh, there was a power struggle there, there was a, a lot of difficulty, okay, uh, my second oldest brother actually ended up being stronger and taller than my oldest brother, than the firstborn, and he basically didn't let the oldest or the firstborn kind of rule over him. And that's why there were a lot of fights, a lot of arguments, and, um, and he didn't take it from him. You know, he didn't let the firstborn kind of rule over him and, and be the authority, the, the authority. Okay, so that oldest brother, actually, he, things didn't work out very well for him. You know, he was, you know, at first on his throne, then it was knocked off the throne. And uh, as he got older, he actually, uh, he didn't achieve much at the beginning. Uh, he actually, uh, you know, was a problem child, so to speak, hanging out with delinquents and things like that. He actually dropped out of high school, didn't go on to college, and was actually, uh, you know, the one that achieved less. Um, and what happened to him is, yeah, for a while, he was very insecure, very hostile and aggressive, he was very mean, uh, especially with me. I was the youngest. I'll talk about that later. Um, he was, yeah, he was very mean, had a lot of trouble because he, had, he mostly experienced the negative side. He didn't have to achieve the, the success at the beginning. So he dropped out of high school. Things went very badly for him and he bounced from job to job. Um, and then, uh, you know, basically, eventually what happened is things turned around for him. Eventually things turned around for him and he, and, and having one of these odd jobs here and there, he met someone who actually liked him and someone that promoted him basically. And uh, now he works for a big steel recycling company, actually the, big, the biggest steel recycling company in the U.S. And I'm not sure what his title is, but since, he, uh, since, the, since the president of the company really liked him, he moved him up, uh, and now he has some executive position and he makes more money than all of us. And he is now a person in a position of power, a position of authority, although things didn't work out very well for him at the beginning. He was a high school dropout, never went to college. But things worked out for him in the end, you know, I guess just it's just that chance or that or that luck or or someone really liked him and liked his social skills. He's really good with people and stuff. Um, and because of that, somebody noticed him and promoted him. And now he's doing quite well, makes more money than all of us. And, uh, you know, now he has this position of authority. Now he's a high achiever, at least in the workplace, even though he doesn't really have a college degree. Uh, and now he's happy. Right now he has the power, the authority and things like that. But not with us, not with the rest of his siblings, but at least at his work now. But yeah, he was the firstborn. He experienced both sides of this, okay? The high achievement, well, at least with work, and also the insecurity, the failure, and the hostility, and the, uh, and the aggression. So it went both ways uh, for him. Let's keep going. So that's the firstborn. And then we have the secondborn. The secondborn is born into a very different situation, okay? The secondborn is, is raised by less concerned, more relaxed parents. So with your firstborn, it's the first one, and you don't really, uh, well, you're, you, you wanna make sure you do things right, so you're very attentive and you try to do everything right. With, by the time the second born comes along, your second child, it's like, you feel like, all right, we've been through this before. Uh, you know, we know what we're doing, I know what I'm doing. So you're less concerned, okay, more relaxed. Um, you don't really try as hard because you know more or less what you need to do and you don't have to overdo things, okay? Second born children don't really feel dethroned because they weren't, there, they weren't the first born. They weren't on the throne. They never got to be on the throne. And they have the older sibling, the first born as a model, someone they can look up to. 
And sometimes they can feel inferior and resent the firstborn because the firstborn, you know, could be bigger and stronger and, and more advanced, maybe smarter because they are older. Um, and they may feel inferior to that firstborn and may resent that firstborn because that firstborn is further ahead. They may try to compete and surpass uh, that firstborn, right? That's where that sibling rivalry comes in, right? Uh, where they try to compete. They're very competitive. The secondborn is competitive, wants to catch up and surpass the firstborn, okay? Um, the secondborn doesn't really benefit from power. They're not driven by it so they didn't, because they didn't really have it growing up, so they're not used to it. As adults, uh, secondborn children tend to be very competitive, very ambitious, because they had the firstborn to kind of compete with, to try to surpass. So they tend to be very ambitious, uh, competitive or ambitious if things go well with them and, and therefore can achieve something. But if they are always under their firstborn shadow and they can't compete very well, they don't do very well, what happens is that they develop inferiority under achievement. If they feel that the, if things don't go well for them, they feel that they could never surpass the firstborn, that they're not smart enough or good looking enough or strong enough or whatever it is, and may always feel that they're always living under the firstborn's shadow, so to speak. And because of that, they may feel inferior and depressed and give up and suffer from underachievement. My second oldest brother, as an example, uh, he didn't suffer from inferiority or underachievement. He was competitive and tries to surpass my oldest brother. And he did, at least when it comes to school. Okay, he did very well in school. He, my second oldest brother was actually the first one to go to college. He's the one who set the example, not my oldest brother. He dropped out and things didn't go well for him at the beginning, but my second oldest brother was very competitive, tried to do, do better and be better. He was the first one to go to college and then, you know, eventually got a law degree and, you know, now he's, he's doing well, but still the firstborn makes more money because, well, he got lucky, so to speak. But the secondborn was competitive and, and achieved success. So he is competitive, is ambitious, uh, even um, to this day, but he is the you know, the second born. He thinks he is better than everybody else, actually, by the way, <laughs> because he was competitive. He did uh, achieve quite a bit and that surpassed uh, the, the first born. There's a bit of narcissism there on, when it comes to the second oldest brother. You know, he does think he's the smartest, the best looking one and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, he has a bit, of, a bit of a superiority conflict. But he's the second born and he was very competitive, very ambitious. And he was the one who really set the stage, who really set the example for the rest of us. He was the first one to go to college. And not just in my family, in my extended family as well. So I guess you could say he does have a lot to be proud of. You know, but because before that, we weren't really, we weren't really thinking about that. We weren't thinking about going to college. And then a lot of us followed af afterward. So he did really set an example. Let's keep going. Uh, let's talk about um, the youngest. There are other, ch other children, you know, there could be a middle child, um, but, you know, Adler doesn't have a whole, all the categories, but there is also the youngest child, okay? The youngest child. Um, so the youngest child is the family pet. Well cared, they're well cared for. It's like the baby of the family. They're well taken care of, well cared for, right? They don't feel dethroned. They never were on the throne. They're the youngest. They have the least authority, the least influence out of all, okay? They have older siblings as models. So they may feel driven to surpass them, right? Might try to catch up to the older siblings. So they might develop very quickly, you know, and try to do well in school, try, you know, try to uh, develop those adult behaviors uh, quite quickly. And I was actually, in my family, I'm the youngest. I come from a family of five. I have four, bro I actually have three brothers and one sister, and I am the youngest, okay? Um, and, um, you know, my family was poor, right? Uh, but, um, to my brothers, I was like the family pet, well cared for, well taken care of. I'm the baby. So I was treated a little bit nicer, so to speak. Um, and financially, the family is usually, if things go well, the family's doing a little bit better financially by the time they have the, you know, the youngest child, by the time several children come along, you know, hopefully if things work out well, the family's doing better. And my family was doing a little bit better, but we were poor. Not like we had everything. We were very poor. Um, but my brothers complained and said, you, that, that I'm the youngest, that, you, that they told me that, oh, well, you didn't have to work when you were a kid, right? And try to, try to help out with the, with the finances and things like that. And you're, you're the youngest, so you were treated better. You got to benefit from our hard work, so to speak. You know, so family pet, well cared for. Yeah, treated a little bit nicer. But at the same time, you have no authority. You don't have much influence. So I've experienced all of that. Um, as adults, uh, the youngest, uh, 
ch ch children, uh, they tend to be high achievers if things work out well for them because they try to develop quickly. Or if things don't go well for them, they may feel helpless uh, and dependent, you know, and, and just be miserable. Um, and I actually, just like uh, my oldest brother, I experienced both of those, you know. I was a high achiever in high school. I did very well. Uh, and actually was the valedictorian of my high school. I did very well, very high GPA. And, uh, you know, uh, didn't know much about who I was, but what I wanted to do. And uh, everyone told me, or the counselor told me, hey, you're good at math. Why don't you, you know, apply as an engineering major? Why don't you try to be an engineer? So I did that and I got into MIT, believe it or not, right? I was a high achiever. But then, you know, a young, poor kid, you know, Latino coming from a, a very rough, poor neighborhood with a really crappy school, uh, no way was I ready for MIT. I went there and I struggled and I eventually failed, okay? And I dropped out is what happened. I had to pick myself up again, kind of start. So I went through the community college experience a little bit and, you know, only spent a year there because I had some units and then uh, actually even took some extension courses at UCLA, some night courses, actually, you know, taught by part-time people there at UCLA. Uh, and eventually, uh, you know, what, then transferred to Riverside and um, only spent a year there, you know, because I already had several units and I, uh, I graduated and then did really well there and, uh, and then went to USC for, uh, for a PhD program and I got my PhD there. And uh, since then, uh, since getting my PhD, I've been uh, uh, teaching here at uh, Antelope Valley College. I did teach while I was working my, on my PhD uh, because you, you do earn a master's degree, master's degree along the way. So I taught part-time at three different places before I actually got my full-time job while I was working on my PhD. And now I'm here. So I've, I've experienced the high achievement, but also the helplessness dependent, dependency. I remember when things didn't go well and when I did drop out and how miserable, how depressed I was. So you know, I've experienced both of those, you know, there is some, uh, some truth to this. There is another situation, uh, um, uh, you know, the, a unique situation, which is the only child. The only child is a very unique situation. The only child has all the parents' resources, all the parents' attention, just like the firstborn, except that the only child doesn't have a second child come along and knock them off their throne. So they're always on the throne, so to speak. They don't feel dethroned. They remain the center of attention. They spend more time in the company of adults because they don't grow up with other siblings. So they spend more time in the company of adults and therefore they mature early. They're, the people who they have to look up to are adults, not other siblings, okay? They develop adult behaviors uh, quickly. They, uh, they can have difficulties outside the home if they're not the center of attention because they didn't learn to share, they don't learn to compete. Uh, they're given everything as being the only child, so to speak. So they don't really have to earn things, have to compete. They may have trouble in school when they're not the center of attention or at work when they're grown up if they're not the center of attention. As adults, they feel disappointment if their abilities don't bring recognition, don't bring success. They, they feel awful because they're used to being the center of attention. They're used to, be, they're used to having things given to them or, you know, or, or having things. And in the world, people don't just give you things. Usually they don't just give you things, you have to earn them. And it can be hard for the only child, if the only child doesn't achieve success, they can feel very miserable and be prone to alcoholism and drug use and things like that if things don't work out very well. That's the only child, right? They have a very unique situation where they weren't knocked off their throne, but eventually they grow up and they learn that the world is gonna treat them the way their parents do. And they don't know that uh, you know, until they have those other experiences where they experience that they're not the center of attention. Okay, but they do like being the center of attention. You know, they do like uh, a lot of recognition because that's what they're used to. Um, maybe you guys can share after the recording is over if you're an only child or something like that. But, um, you know, I don't have that situation in my family, so I can't really tell you much about that. But I can tell you about other people's experiences, but I think I want to hear yours instead. Okay, so that's Adler's theory, but we need to talk about the assessment in Adler's theory. What did Adler do to assess? Uh, individuals basically to try to determine their star, style of life, their personality, that kind of stuff. Um, well, first of all, observations were very important to, um, you know, to, uh, to Adler. He observed people, he, he noticed how they walked, how they talk, how they shake hands, their posture, that kind of stuff. He, uh, he observed a lot of different things. And one of those things that uh, he observed was uh, 
sleeping position, where he wanted to know about sleeping position. I don't think he did any actual research, but he had this idea about sleeping position, that your sleeping position determines your personality to some extent is related to your personality. Like if you're the type of person who sleeps on, if you sleep on your back, for instance, or if, you, if you're restless, right? You move around a lot, or if you sleep on your back, according to Adler, that means that you want to be important. You want to seem important, right? That's what it means. Think about it this way. If you sleep on your back, you're like the king, right? Like, the, like, like uh, Tutankhamun, like, you know, the Pharaohs, they, they, they're laid down on their back and they're entombed, like you're on your back, basically. And it's like you're, it's, the, it's called the king position, right? If you sleep on your back, okay? You're exposed, you're not afraid of anything, you're like the king, okay? If you're restless or you sleep on your back, that means you want to seem important, according to Adler. Uh, Adler. If you sleep on your stomach, that's like in the fetal position, all curled up, that means you're stubborn and you have a negative personality according to, uh, actually on your, not, no, that's fetal position is different. If you sleep on your stomach, fetal position is when you're on your side. If you sleep on your stomach, like on your stomach, face down, basically, that means you're stubborn and you have a negative personality, according to Adler. If you sleep in the fetal position, all curled up, right, like, a, like an infant, that means you're fearful of interacting with others. You're like that fearful child. If you sleep uh, with your arms outstretched, that means that you're in need of nurturing and you crave support, right? That seems a little bit weird, right? Um, but he had some ideas about sleep position. I can tell you now that uh, research does not support his ideas about sleep position, but there's no correlation between how you sleep and your personality, okay? At least not the research that I have read. Um, another important thing about Adler's theory, he was interested in early recollections. Like what are the earliest memories uh, that you recall, right? What are your earliest memories? And usually children do not remember very much from their first few years of life. So people's earliest memories have to do when, when they're like four or five usually, not earlier than that, because memory doesn't work very well earlier than that. Your earliest memories, according to Adler, uh, indicate your style of life. What are the, some of the earliest things that you remember? Like for physicians and many uh, doctors, if you talk to them, some of their, their earliest recollections include like remembering that someone was sick or that somebody died, which means they're, you know, they're concerned with that kind of stuff and they go on to become physicians. Um, for me, some of my earliest memories are about me basically playing outside, being out in the field and playing outside with little sticks and little rocks. We were poor, okay? We didn't really have toys, like growing up in El Salvador, right? Um, and, uh, and that's what I remember. And, uh, you know, I don't really, I mean, I do love the outdoors. I love to be out there. I love to hike and jog out there. Uh, be out there. I was mountain biking and uh, you know, I was doing that for a while until I had a nasty fall and hurt myself and broke some ribs and I'm still recovering from that. I feel a lot better by the way, but it takes about six to eight weeks to recover from that. Um, but that's what I remember. Yeah, I, I like things about the outdoors, you know, um, and you don't really see that side of me because I'm a professor and stuff. Um, but my earliest recollections basically uh, imply that I'm the kind of person who likes to be outside, out in the open, away from people. You know, I, I use that basically to, um, you know, to, how should I say, to refresh myself, to be out there, to get away from people, get away from trouble, get away from stress. That's, that's the way I, um, that's the way I, I sort of, uh, not withdraw, but that's the way I, uh, that's the way I cope with things. So that's some of my early recollections. I can share you, with you some uh, other uh, early recollections, uh, but actually I want to save it for when we get to some of the research about other people and their earliest recollections. Okay, and then it'll remind me of some other examples that I've heard. Okay, I can tell you now, but I, I'll save it for that because it comes up. Uh, dream analysis was also important for Adler's theory. Um, some similarities there, with, similarities there with Freud that your dreams basically uh, reveal something about who you are, okay? Uh, dream analysis, so dreams involve your current problems and what we intend to do about it. So according to Adler, your dreams basically reveal your style of life. They reveal who you are how you deal with things, how you deal with problems, okay? So a little bit of a Freudian thing there that yes, your dreams reveal a lot about your personality, although he's not really talking about the unconscious here. Um, but dreams, I guess, is kind of unconscious stuff, okay? Uh, some common interpretations of dreams, just like Freud, he has uh, dream symbols. I'm not sure if I really told you much about Freud's dream symbols. I think I mentioned a few of them. Um, but there are some dream symbols and they're different from Freud's. Um, according to Adler, if you dream about falling, that means you have a fear of losing self-esteem. 
fear of prestige. If you, if you, if you dream about falling, a lot of people dream about falling, you know, it's a common thing that people dream about. Um, but it, according to Adler, it means that you're afraid that you're going to lose self-esteem, you're going to lose prestige, that something's going to go wrong. If you dream about flying, that reveals an ambitious style of life. Uh, I've had dreams about flying, you know, and what I have found is when I have dreams about flying, it's usually when I feel happy when something is going to be accomplished. Like I started having dreams about flying when I was almost done with graduate school because I felt like I was going to be free. According to Adler, indicates that you're ambitious and that you want to achieve a lot. Dreaming about being chased, which is a common thing people dream about. If you dream about being chased, according to Adler, it means that you feel weak in relation to others, that you feel, you know, powerless, kind of like you're afraid of others, okay? If you dream about being naked, that means you have some fear of revealing yourself, okay? That uh, you have something to hide, so to speak. Um, I don't recall if I told you guys so much about the Freudian dream symbols. Uh, I think I did. I think I did. You know, like hats, if you dream about hats, that reveals genitalia, according to Freud. Uh, if you dream about, um, ah, I forget some of the other things. Uh, but a lot of things are sexual. Okay. But anyway, we don't need to think about the Freudian dream symbols now. But these are some of the dream symbols of, uh, of Adler. And there are others, by the way. These are just some of the common ones, some of the common things that people dream about. So yes, uh, probing into dreams is important also for revealing your personality and revealing what's happening. Um, assessment and Adler's theory, uh, there are um, measures of social interest, okay? Uh, uh, questionnaires, surveys that have been developed to try to measure how much social interest somebody has. There's the social interest scale, where you choose the word that best describes you know, certain attributes, like whether you're helpful, sympathetic, uh, consider it right. There's a social in, social in, interest index where you rate the degree to which you agree with certain things. Like I don't mind helping out friends. That's an example. Uh, you uh, you basically um, rate uh, yourself on the extent to which you agree to certain things. And I actually have the social interest scale. Uh, I would show you the handout if we were in class. Um, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to post it so you can see it. Okay, because usually we'd, we'd basically, we'd look at this in class and I'd have you guys fill it out and we, we would talk about it. But in Zoom, we can't really do it. So I'm, I'm gonna post it and if you guys wanna look at it, fill it out, um, you know, then, then you can. And I'll, I'll try to post the one that tells you how to score it too. So you can answer it and then you can score yourself and you can see what it says about you. Okay, uh, and there's also the Solomon scale of social interests, which I don't have, I have the, the SI handout, which I, I've looked for a lot of these things and I found some of them. And those are measures of social interest. Um, Adler's on, uh, I mean, research on Adler's theory, uh, some of the same criticism when, when it comes to uh, uh, Adler's theory, same criticisms that we have for Freud, for Jung, uh, these early Neo-Freudians, they, they weren't scientists, they weren't researchers, they all used case studies. They basically, they were all kind of like therapists or psychoanalysts and they treated people, they try to help people one-on-one. -on -one. So they made use of case studies. That's where they got a lot of their ideas. So they didn't really do research. They didn't really do any experiments. So you can't really verify what they did. You can't replicate it. You can't, you know, not, it's not like you can do a study like they did, they didn't do any studies. No verbatim records, no word for word records, no representative sample. You can't really generalize from his case studies, right? They treated people who had problems. Analysis of his data was subjective, unreliable. I mean, they got their ideas from what they saw from the people they treated. Conclusions may have been biased to fit his theory. Same criticisms that we have basically for all the Neo-Freudians. Uh, let's keep going. Other research, there's research on uh, uh, experimental, uh, experimental tests of Adler's concepts. Um, dreams, basically, uh, according to research, uh, we dream about important unresolved problems, okay? Like uh, if you're stressed out about something, an exam coming up, or, or you're starting a new job and you're having some trouble, you will dream about those things. According to research, we dream about things that are unresolved. Um, and we also dream about stressful situations. And according to Adler, in your dreams, how you deal with those things reveals your style of life. Early recollections. There's a very interesting uh, research on early recollections, people's earliest memories. Like people who are depressed, when people who are depressed are asked about what the earliest thing that they remember, they remember things that have to do with abandonment and neglect, which basically says a lot about how they're feeling and why they may have those tendencies to be uh, depressed. 
criminals, some of their earliest memories are very disturbing, aggressive interactions. Um, I had a student uh, years ago who took my class uh, and, um, you know, this student was an, an ex-gangster, you know, an ex, uh, basically a criminal, basically a gangster, you know, and the only reason he was in my class, well, was because, well, not the only, it's a big reason, but his life had changed. See, he, he was a gangster and he got shot and he ended up paralyzed from the neck down. So now that he, now that he was paralyzed, basically in a wheelchair, couldn't be out there gangbanging anymore. He decided that he was going to go to school and go to college. And he did. And there he was in my class. I mean, he was a very good student, by the way, very smart. And he told me, you know, when we talked about this, his earliest memories was about, was about him taking a knife and tearing up the furniture. That was his earliest memories, right? And this guy used to be a gangster. He was a gangster for many years, a criminal for many years, but then his life changed and then he went to school. But he still had some tendencies that he would get very upset if he didn't agree with him on something. You know, um, so, but he was very smart and then, you know, wanted to, but his thing was that uh, now that he was in a wheelchair and he couldn't do much, he wanted to show people that he can still do something, you know, like if you told him he can't do something, he would do it. And that was, he was, he was there to prove something, so to speak, but he was shot and paralyzed from, he, they sh shot him and he was paralyzed from the neck down. When you're a criminal or gangster, chances are you're going to end up dead in jail or prison, or you're going to end up basically, uh, you know, paralyzed, you know, or, you know, basically, uh, uh, you know, disabled in some form from, from being shot or being beaten or something. Those are the, that's probably what's going to happen to you if you don't change what you're doing. Delinquents, some of their earliest memories are about breaking the rules, doing things they're not supposed to do. Okay. Um, research on social interests reveals that those who score higher on those social interest measures are more cooperative, more empathetic, more responsible and more popular with others. They have more interest in people and helping people and cooperating. Okay, and now, like I said, I'll post that social interest scale right under the uh, lecture and uh, the PowerPoint so you can look at it yourself. Hopefully, if you want to take it, you're honest with in, 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 the, in, in answering the questions and then, uh, and then you see how you score. Uh, experimental tests of birth order. Um, firstborns, there's research on firstborns and research suggests that uh, firstborns are actually overrepresented in college in high level management. So, uh, you know, basically uh, saying that there is some truth there to Adler's theory that firstborns, yes, do like to be in charge. They do like uh, to be uh, in a position of authority and they do like, a, they like to be high achievers. So you'll see more firstborns in college, okay? And they tend to, uh, and you'll see more of them in high level management. They're used to being, uh, you know, uh, in positions of authority, they're used to power and they seek those things. They're more likely to be eminent, right? Which means they're prestigious, they're more likely to be intellectual, more likely to have power and prestige. They score higher in tests of English, math, and verbal skills because they're the firstborn, you know, and they feel that they have to be smarter and better. And because of that, they may work harder and do better on these tests. Later borns are more competitive, right? They try to compete with the firstborn more ambitious, and they can have lower self-esteem if things don't work out well, or lower self-esteem if they can't surpass the, the firstborn. And I can tell you that there's many, many uh, secondborn children who feel inferior compared to their, to their older sibling, their older brother, or their older sister, that they feel they're not as good looking, not as smart, not as successful. There's even celebrities, okay? People who are like, uh, like successful musicians and movie stars, who are second born and who feel that they're still not as good as their older brother or their oldest sister or not as talented, even though they are more successful because they still see themselves as inferior compared to their, uh, their oldest sibling. Later born children tend to be pampered, right? They tend to be better taken care of because they're the baby of the family and tend to have adjustment problems if things don't work out well, you know, like they can become uh, alcoholics for instance. And I, I did have adjustment problems. I, I did experience depression. That's what led me to psychology, by the way, in experiencing that and having my life fall apart. Um, but I, I never really got into alcohol. You know, I did drink from time to time, only when, only during occasions though, you know, there's a party here and there, you know, every three months or something like that or something like that. But I didn't really do drugs or anything like that. But I did have the adjustment problems. And often when people have adjustment problems, they will often turn to drugs to self-medicate, to make themselves feel better. If you're an only child, research shows you're more self-centered and you're less popular, right? 
but you also are, tend to be high, high achievers because you like to be the center of attention. In order to get that, you have to be a high achiever, right? Because after a while, your parents aren't going to be the ones who are going to be giving you a lot of attention. You want a lot of attention from the outside world. And uh, that is where we will stop. I will stop recording.